can I can I welcome everybody to the afternoon session of this uh, research day for the AIA conference for 2021, all online, of course. Uh, for those of you with us this morning, you will have heard four presentations on uh, the impact of COVID and industrial archaeology and heritage. This afternoon, we're handing over the discussion to the Association for Industrial Archaeology's Young Members Board, who will be picking up on that theme and um, expanding it to look at some of the uh, current issues in industrial archaeology and heritage. Before I go any further, I just need to say that if you look at the chat facility, you'll find some free digital downloads. Um, so, so some freebies for you. Uh, that includes uh, some free material from Taylor and Francis, who are, of course, are the publishers of Industrial Archaeology Review, and they, they, they print our IA news for us as well. So I, uh, I urge you to go over to the chat facility and have a look. If you're not sure where that is, on a PC, it'll be on the bar at the bottom. Um, on smaller devices, you might have to check to the side or the top, but uh, do go to that facility, the chat facility, and download the free material. Otherwise, you're missing out. Of course, one of the disadvantages of being online is you don't get to browse all those uh, stalls and so forth. So we've got a digital store instead. Now, our speakers this afternoon, um, it, we've got four speakers this afternoon. Um, Zoe Arthurs will be uh, starting us off in a moment. Uh, Zoe is the heritage management archaeologist with Clue Paris Archaeological Trust. We've got uh, Dr. Juan Sanchez, uh, who will be on second, and Juan is a lecturer at the University of Science and Technology in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And we've got uh, Dr. Penelope uh, Foreman. She's the uh, community archaeologist for uh, Clue Paris Archaeological Trust. And finally, Emma Lockwood, who uh, looks after um, the archaeology uh, uh, publications and journals at Taylor and Francis and for whom we have to thank some of our uh, digital download store material. So that's enough of me this afternoon. Well, I, I will be back later on to act as host. And um, we're hoping to finish off with a round table question and answer with the young members board at the centre. And hopefully everything will be wrapped up by 4.30. So enough of me. If Zoe, if you are ready, um, I'm going to hand over to you for the first of this afternoon's four presentations. Um, and uh, you can get you can get the ball rolling now. Lovely. Thank you very much. If you could all just bear with me while I set up the screen. And there we go. I'm hoping everybody can see that well. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Young Members Board afternoon of conference. Um, it's just a reminder to everybody, if you could keep your um, mics off during the presentation, and if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat for the roundtable discussion at the end. Um, I also ask that um, we all be respectful of everybody else's opinions and experiences so that we can have uh, an open discussion and a pleasant afternoon. Um, so the topic of my discussion is research and sustainability in industrial archaeology, the COVID legacy. So this is me. Uh, this is me at the Shrewsbury Castle dig when we were allowed out on a brief reprieve over the summer. Um, we were looking for a medieval chapel, but we found a Victorian greenhouse instead. <laughs> so, so we won't talk too much about that. Um, and this is the title page of my uh, dissertation. Um, I am denied about the content of this discussion, but I thought as a representative of the Young Members Board, I could not let the opportunity pass, um, having just completed my master's to talk about the experience of researching at master's level during a pandemic. Um, and following on from that, I will discuss elements of my research, um, focusing mainly on COVID, um, 
and the challenges and the opportunities that that has brought, um, keeping in theme with the conference. Um, and if anyone's interested in a follow up discussion or would like to receive a copy of my dissertation, just get in touch with me at the end. I've got some contact details on the uh, last slide. So uh, firstly, I wanted to look at expectations of research. We all know or have an idea of what constitutes good research. Um, and uh, the, the points uh, that I have on this slide are talking about um, the high quality hallmarks a variety of sources, seeing the general public and engaging and interacting with them, especially for uh, archaeology and heritage, more um, the social science side of it, um, seeking advice from our peers, both within academic institutions and further afield, immersion in the research topic and theme, site visits, experiences. Um, and these are the things that over the past two years, myself and thousands of other students have not had access to. So in any normal year, um, we would have access to libraries, both public and academic libraries, museums, archives, heritage sites. We would travel both within the UK and abroad. Um, and this year we have had Google, a lot of Google, uh, online journals, eBooks, email and Zoom. And so access to appropriate sources was limited and we've had to make do and adapt and reimagine and utilize these resources and just do our best. Research in a topic like industrial archaeology is especially difficult, as um, I'm sure many of you know, these sites are absolutely huge, um, sprawling, numerous and often remote. And without the sight of tangible buildings, places, landscapes um, and historic archives, many of which I found are yet to be digitised, um, the discipline is, is near impossible to study in the way that you would want to during a pandemic. So in order to carry out my research, uh, I had to abandon a, a placement I was partway through um, at the IGMT archives. And I had to adapt to the research topic to suit a desk based assessment. Um, I renegotiated my research design with uh, my mentor and I set about making new connections. I did this, one of the ways I did this was by joining the YMB and establishing an online presence for myself via Twitter and LinkedIn, places like that, um, in order to connect with people who were interested and qualified in that field. Um, and lastly, I had to manage my own expectations because I needed to figure out where I could afford to compromise um, and where I couldn't and accepting that the project was not what it was going to be, but to still try my best and make a best effort. And let's not forget, though, that many students, including myself, experienced some or all of uh, these feelings during the course of their research in addition to the anticipated dissertation stress, um, we were still expected to produce high quality work. Um, and students across the board in the past two years just won't have produced what, what they may have had, um, their full potential in any other year. Um, and this does need to be accounted for in the coming years in peer reviews and the awards processes, um, because the access to content just wasn't there. Um, and there was a lot of catching up to do, which our brilliant rep, um, Emma from Taylor and Francis, will discuss with us later on this afternoon. Um, and so I'm moving on now to uh, some of my research outcomes, uh, sustainability for IA, the COVID legacy. So to, to begin, I'll go over a brief, uh, a brief methodology. Um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the research was primarily desk based uh, with only my previous experiences at industrial heritage sites uh, to lean on. Uh, I sent invitations for interviews to UK industrial heritage sites and affiliated organisations, uh, research journals and ebooks and made use of the information I collected prior to the dreaded lockdown. I utilised my ever expanding home library and there were plenty and um, plenty of visits from my postman. Um, which I count myself as privileged for because there are many students who would not be able to afford to purchase uh, from Amazon and, and other bookstores because as you know these books they don't come cheap um, 
some of the information uh, that I was privy to over the course of my research um, is sensitive. And so as I discuss some of the issues in the following slides, uh, the names of companies and organisations uh, may be omitted. However, if you do want sight of those, they are available in the appendices of the um, dissertation. So again, if you'd like a copy, just get in touch. So economic impact is naturally something which needs to be discussed when looking at the COVID legacy and its impact on industrial archaeology. And not all industrial heritage sites were created equal. Many of our national industrial archaeology treasures are reliant on volunteer workforce and charitable fundraising. Places like Snell Beach Lead Mine and the Coal and Pumping Station in Shrewsbury um, without visitor footfall, income, donations and secondary and tertiary spends, there's no money keeping these places afloat. So these sorts of sites are also less likely to have the skill set required to submit high level grant fund applications for things like the Cultural Recovery Fund. Um, because members are skilled in other areas such as engagement, heritage crafts, engineering, um, Volunteers tend to be uh, very young people new to the sector or of aging population who may not be um, brushed up on how grant, uh, grant fund uh, applications are put together. Um, that skill set tends to reside with the salaried folk at larger scale government and centrally funded sites. Some organisations have actually come out of the pandemic financially more stable than when it started with staff eligible for furlough and no salaries to pay out, money coming in steadily from the government and other sources, the right skill set, um, as well as resulted in quite a comfortable uh, financial nest egg for some, which um, we know it does go into conservation and uh, engagement. Um, but there has been disparity between uh, the income between large scale and smaller scale organisations. Many voluntary run organisations, though, sadly, have not survived the pandemic and the true impact is yet to be revealed. Uh, early estimations suggest up to 60% of voluntary organisations have yet to reopen or plan uh, or have declared closure. Sites um, such as uh, the lead mine, which relies, relies on volunteers to lead guided walks and tours uh, for a small fee. Uh, cannot offer the same service because many of their members are aging and they're choosing to shield rightly because health has to come first um, and the devastating legacy um, will be ongoing for many many years without advocacy and fundraising assets assets that were already at risk of demolition and closure will be even more vulnerable these small scale sites are frequently at the heart of many communities and we need a resurgence of ownership uh, volunteering and pride in our local heritage, even large sites with salaried staff, uh, but which rely on the expertise and funding support of volunteers are struggling to keep exhibits open and machines running. One example that the YMB visited recently um, at uh, Elscar Industrial Heritage Centre, they have been unable to open their railway as the trust who supported them historically no longer exists. Which leads me to a slightly more optimistic note, uh, the future. Many places like Giverton Mine um, have now integrated financial resilience into their future planning. And this includes benefits and exhibits for local communities should travel restrictions limit overseas and out of town visitors. Uh, project projections to determine what funding will be required for the years ahead and a resilience pot to lean back on when times are tough. Engaging local communities has been, but should now more than ever be a top priority for sites for industrial heritage in the UK, um, because these are the people who will willingly give their time to care for and maintain assets within their community. These are the folk who will visit when nobody else can, if other lockdowns occur, and they're the people who will share their love and their pride um, and their recommendations of their community and attract more audiences in the future going forward. In addition to improving community cohesion, industrial archaeology and our affiliated organisations must commit to closing the skills gap. It's not right that small scale volunteer led sites and groups are closed because 
of a lack of knowledge in what is essentially form filling. We need more organisations like the Young Members Board who are willing to support and offer mentorship to those new to the sector or working within voluntary organisations on the grant fund application process. The pots are finite, they always have been, they always will be, but equity and distribution of funds will help raise the profile of industrial archaeology across the UK. Um, not just the elite select few mega museums. Um, industrial archaeology in the UK is outstanding and there is so much of it and it's all with its own story to tell. Um, and hopefully our industrial networks with some collaboration can be stronger for it. And then when we do that, we inspire the next generation to follow in our footsteps and uh, we advocate for industrial archaeology and we hope that we can see less of what's happening, uh, such as at Dorman Long Tower, I'm sure you've all seen the news today, um, and hopefully inspire another group of people to come along and look after our industrial archaeology and learn the skills necessary to uh, keep these things in the condition they deserve to be in. Um, that's that's my presentation. You'll find me if you if you would like to find me on Twitter, um, either as as myself or as the YMB. Uh, also on LinkedIn and via email, and I'll be around all afternoon to answer questions as part of the YMB roundtable. So thank you very much. Thank you, Zoe. That was that was brilliant. Uh, chimed in certainly with a lot of uh, the information and data I've seen as industrial heritage support officer over the last uh, eighteen months. Uh, now, just a reminder to those people who were with us this morning: we're not taking questions after each session, uh, after each talk, as we did this morning. Instead, we're going to have that roundtable discussion. So we're straight on to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Juan Sanchez, and uh, I'm glad to see that Juan has uh, already shared his presentation. Some of you will be familiar with him because uh, Juan was at the last live uh, AIA research seminar back in 2019. So, Juan, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so, well, I think everybody is already seeing my screen and hopefully uh, listening to my voice too. So, uh, well, good night from China, good afternoon there. And thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, sharing this experience of a new series of uh, online workshops uh, between the East and the West to, to discuss uh, about industrial archeology. span So this series of workshops has uh, been actually, or are much in depth actually with the pandemic since it was the impossibility to travel and to do this kind of meetings in person that, well, that moved us to, uh, to organize uh, this as a series of online workshops, which in the end, I think it has been actually positive since it has uh, allowed for a much more wider audience. So this series of workshop is uh, organized uh, jointly by the Institute for Cultural Heritage and the History of Science and Technology that belongs to uh, the University of Science and Technology Beijing in China and the Association for Industrial Archaeology uh, together with the joint members uh, board. So uh, this series of workshops try to put the focus on archaeology, I mean on industrial archaeology, borrowing uh, the expression of, of Professor Palmer, industrial archaeology as archaeology. And I, I say this because, well, this is uh, quite common in the United Kingdom, but it's not uh, common abroad, especially it is not common on the East. So, uh, well, this year, this last part of years with all these online meetings ongoing, uh, we have actually seen uh, plenty, tens of super interesting meetings about the industrial past, but most of them have been, uh, has been focused on uh, the heritage of the industrial past, that is industrial heritage, or uh, the history of technology. So we have all these meetings going on, uh, that have uh, uh, all the focus 
on industrial heritage. So here uh, I wanted to put, to put the focus, sorry, on the archeology span of uh, the industrial period. We are not the only one doing this, by the way, because we have also our colleagues in America uh, from the Society of Industrial Archaeology uh, who are also running a series of online lectures on industrial archaeology. But in any way, what I was trying to, uh, were, what we were trying to do with this series of uh, uh, workshops uh, were uh, to was to promote uh, industrial archaeology as the archaeology of the industrial period also in the east because uh, well in this side of the wall as I said industrial archaeology as an as an as an archaeology is, is totally uncommon and I, I want to say before I continue that uh, of course in industrial archaeology we need much more uh, many more disciplines not only archaeology so. So we need also the contribution of the engineers, we need the contribution of the heritage scholar, uh, science historians, and so on. It's just that I feel personally that there are many meetings, very good meetings uh, going on about those topics, but not so many on the archaeology, on the proper archaeology of the industrial past. So, so far, uh, we have only uh, had uh, one of these uh, meetings, uh, which happened in May this year. And as you can see there in the poster, uh, we counted with, well, the, the, the best of the best uh, from the East and from the West. And well, obviously, I'm not saying that uh, for me, but for the rest of the researchers on the, on the poster. I, I would like also to take the chance to, thanks again, uh, Guan Don Don and Bill Baxfield for making the uh, workshop possible uh, that, that day. So uh, the main theme of this first edition was introdu introducing the archaeology of the industrial society because, uh, well, the idea, as I was saying before, was exactly that, to, to, to make uh, uh, the archaeology of the industrial period uh, more popular uh, on the East. Uh, all of them, uh, all the presentation, the whole workshop is available on the uh, Association for Industrial Archaeology's channel in YouTube. So if you want to see all the presentations, uh, you just need to scan that QR code on the screen and you're going to have access to all of them. So I, I will not uh, spend too much time in describing uh, these presentations. I'm just going to uh, mention uh, the main topics of them. So, so first, uh, Professor Palmer discussed uh, the theory of industrial archaeology, and she uh, pointed out uh, to how, uh, well, for many years, decades, actually, industrial archaeology was developed uh, with no theory at all, which produced a series of shortcomings. But this situation changed radically in the 90s and uh, in the first century, on the 21st, uh, in the first decade, sorry, of the 21st century, when uh, the Association for Industrial Archaeology, as well as other scholars, created a, a, a theoretical framework and a research agenda for industrial archaeology, which has started to be, let's say, more practice as a uh, proper archaeology of the industrial period. Following uh, Professor Palmer, uh, Dr. Neville shared uh, a very uh, comprehensive uh, picture of how industrial archaeology is practiced both in the UK and in uh, continental Europe. And in doing so, he, 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 he revealed this double dimension of industrial archaeology as archaeology, as the archaeology of industrial period, but also as a, a preservation movement that has to, to do that is related to industrial uh, heritage. From the east side, we counted on uh, Professor Chan's introduction to industrial archaeology uh, in China. Uh, and he described it uh, with plenty of details how uh, well industrial archaeology is totally undeveloped still in, in this country, in spite of the efforts that we are uh, doing in the Institute. Um, and it's especially underdeveloped if we compare uh, to the situation of industrial heritage studies that have grown exponentially in the last two decades. 
And it was very interesting in, in his talk to notice how uh, industrial archaeology here uh, cover a much wider chronological scope that includes also uh, traditional technologies and also how the focus here is not on the industrial society, but on the history uh, of technology. And finally, uh, myself uh, introduced a kind of a very general comparative approach to the situation in China and, and the UK, comparing uh, both the industrialization processes of these two parts of the world in the past and how the materiality of such industrialization processes is approached today in China and the UK, uh, reaching the main conclusion that we still need to develop the archaeology of industrialization in China and uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, we need to develop more uh, uh, wider and stronger international networks that let us build a discipline that is more diverse and more uh, comprehensive and complex. So uh, several points were discussed uh, after the presentations covering uh, technological overlapping, uh, which could be the contribution of industrial archaeology uh, to the 21st century society, and also uh, the need uh, to, to rethink uh, the chronological borders of the discipline as well as uh, its recent framework for a more global perspective. Because from this uh, point of view, I would say that the main uh, conclusions of this first edition of the workshops was that, well, uh, I would say that uh, it was exposed that when we approach industrial archaeology in a global perspective, we discovered that uh, we are using the term industrial archaeology to refer to uh, very different things. So, uh, of course, in the UK, uh, it has been accepted since the 90s, at least, that industrial archaeology is a period discipline, it's the archaeology of the industrial period, but this approach is not shared by the whole world, right? And for example, in China, industrial archaeology is still a much a thematic discipline. Also, we have this duality between uh, uh, archaeological research and the conservation of industrial heritage, and also uh, different approaches that put the focus on social archaeology, on the archaeology of the industrial society, on or on the history of technology. So we have here a very complex uh, reality and a, a very uh, wide uh, ensemble of different practices that we are developing under the umbrella of industrial archaeology. So it, this is one of the main reasons that I think uh, that this kind of uh, east-west transnational discussions are very interesting to, well, to understand the complexity of the discipline and to uh, uh, approach such uh, diversity uh, with more uh, plural uh, voices. I would say that the first edition of the workshop uh, has a very nice impact in the social media, both in China and in the UK, as well as in other parts of the world. And not surprisingly, I think, uh, we counted on something like 100 people that day uh, coming from three uh, different uh, continents, which I think it was it was a success and really uh, well motivate us to continue uh, with this series of uh, of workshops. So thinking about uh, continuing with this series of workshops, there are maybe some elements uh, here that we need uh, to consider. First is how are we understanding uh, the concepts of East and West? What actually East and West mean? or what do we want them to mean in the context of these series of workshops? And I'm saying this because, well, it would be very interesting if, well, if the time difference uh, allows us to do so, uh, to include also uh, voices and colleagues from uh, Latin America, for example, and from Africa too, right? But, well, we have this uh, uh, complexity of the term because, uh, well, Australia, for example, belongs to the East geographically, but culturally uh, belong to the West, right? While uh, Brazil, for example, it's in the West geographically, but I would not say Brazil is exactly Western culture, it's uh, Latin American culture, right? 
So, so I think that we need to consider uh, what actually this east-west from these series of workshops actually mean, and how are we going to, to involve other countries in our discussions. So another point to consider is that the, in the first edition of the workshop, uh, we had 100% uh, of uh, speakers with senior uh, positions. If we consider uh, associate professor, which is actually my uh, position as a senior uh, position. Uh, out of which, well, three of the speakers, that is all the speakers uh, but me, uh, are actually in leadership uh, positions. And of course, that was absolutely amazing uh, because we brought together uh, a, a very impressive uh, uh, amount of expertise and knowledge, and I'm obviously saying this uh, because of the other three contributors, not uh, for myself. Uh, but at the same time, we, we create this uh, uh, workshop in which all the voices were the voices of experts, let's say. So uh, inspired or motivated by the spirits behind uh, the creation of the Joan Members Board, uh, we have been thinking, and actually we have already decided, uh, that the next edition of the workshops is going to give uh, prominence to uh, young people in industrial archaeology. So, so the theme of the workshop is going to be industrial archaeology, uh, the new generation, and it's going uh, to happen, uh, we hope, in May of 2022. Uh, that is exactly one year after the celebration of the first uh, workshops. Um, now we are not going to uh, reduce the discussion to uh, China and the UK, and we are going to include also other voices, both from uh, the East, India, and from the West, uh, with Portugal. Uh, more specifically, these are the uh, brilliant speakers that we are going to have in the next edition. We will have uh, Wang Yunchen, uh, uh, a colleague here in the Institute for, uh, Industri for uh, Cultural Heritage and History of Science and Technology, and a new member of the Association for Industrial Archaeology too, who will uh, present an, an amazing uh, research in which it has been uh, doing some research on the locational factors of uh, Baidu making in China. Baidu is a, a traditional lead work here. And also she has established a very interesting uh, chronotypology of these uh, workshops. We will also count on Otis Gilbert, one of us in the Joe members uh, board of the association, who will uh, talk on, well, maybe uh, the most uh, popular archaeological tool or archaeological method, right, the excavation. And, she, and he, will, uh, shows, uh, he will show us how uh, archaeological excavation actually uh, works in industrial context. Another uh, member of the Joan Members Board uh, from India, uh, Shekhar uh, Krishna, uh, will talk to us uh, about a topic that I think it's uh, not uh, very well known, at least for uh, to many of us, uh, is the situation, the general situation of industrial archaeology in India and in a more general sense in South Asia. Um, finally, from Portugal, uh, Mario Bruno Pastor, who is now a PhD student in the Portuguese Catholic University, but by the time of uh, the celebration of this workshop, I, was, I wish he will already be a young uh, doctor, He's going to talk also an, uh, about an amazing research that he has been developed recently in which he has applied uh, geographical information system and other uh, digital technologies to do archaeology uh, archaeology of material remains that uh, no longer exist, uh, which I think is also a very interesting research. So, so this is the idea of this new workshop is to counterbalance that gender issue of the first edition, but uh, sorry, age issue of the first edition, but there is perhaps a gender issue in these two first uh, series of uh, editions of the, of the series of workshops since, well, as you can see, till now, 75% uh, of the speakers have been uh, men. So in order to counterbalance that situation too, we already have in mind a third edition to happen in 2023, 
uh, which is going to work on the theme industrial archaeology, uh, the materiality of diversity. So the, the main idea of this uh, third edition of the workshop is going to give voice to uh, two main ideas here. Uh, on one hand, to give uh, voice to uh, the people other than men that are working in the archaeology of the industrial period, and at the same time to give voice to, to, give voice, uh, to any person who is working uh, with the contribution of people other than men to the industrial society, to the contribution of or to the role or, of people other than men in the industrial uh, society. Uh, we will keep China and UK in that discussion because, well, in the UK, uh, we have our brilliant uh, diversity officer who is going to uh, talk after me. And, and in China, we have, uh, well, most of our colleagues here are actually women, as you can see in the window, in the screen, sorry, with some of my uh, students of industrial archaeology. So uh, we are open to people who want to contribute. So if you want to uh, propose yourself or propose anybody else to participate in this third edition of the workshop, please uh, send me an email. Uh, you can see my address there. So that's all from me for now. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope to see you around, see you online in this series of workshops. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anne. Yeah, that's uh, all sounding very exciting over the next couple of years. So uh, look forward to seeing that develop. And, and I think that's one of the really big positives the Association for Industrial Archaeology has seen from the pandemic. We've been forced to think online. We've been forced to think a bit more globally. And I think that's starting to pay real dividends and it's great that the young members boards is at the forefront of that right the, the third of our four uh, talks this afternoon will be by dr penelope uh, foreman so uh hopefully penny is ready to uh to go um are you there penny um no uh oh, right. she's she's coming to us by way of a recording ah Right, over to you then, Bill. Um, so I'll just uh, see if this works. Hopefully this works. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Penny Foreman. I'm on the is, Young Members Board. I'm the Equality... Is that working better? Um, yes, thank I'm you, Bill. I'd like to talk to you about a project that I'm currently working on. Also, you might know Zoe Arthur is also on the board. She's working on it too. And it's working at Tram Road in the Brecon Beacons National Park. Now, this talk is labelled um, different approaches. We do need more, more volume. Projects, more volume. Purely sort of heritage management based and looking at preserving these sites. We're also looking at some different approaches that involve partnership working and ways that we can promote this industrial heritage to the public in some slightly different ways that get better, better engagement with it. So in this talk, I'd just like to talk a little bit about where the project came from, what this industrial heritage is in the Brecon Beacons National Park, um, one of the major sites that we'll be looking at, and also some of the trickier questions that are coming out of this first phase of the project. So first of all, I'd better introduce the Brecon Beacons National Park itself. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, it's one of three national parks in Wales, and it was the last one that was established back in 1957. Um, and as this background pitch that I've chosen here shows, it's widely regarded as sort of a very wild natural landscape. It's really popular for people who are coming to sort of escape things. Some of the busier paths do get very, very busy and are not much like escaping things at all. If you've seen pictures of people um, walking up Penavan and places like that, it can be a little bit busy. Um, but most of it is a huge sort of like vast rural empty space that's very isolated that people come to for that sense of nature and disconnecting. Um, it's actually designated as an international dark sky reserve just because it's so isolated, the skies are so dark and clear for the excellent to look at the night sky. Um, it has lots of very different natures though. It's also home to a military training site. So lots of people um, come here for sort of various um, strength, stamina training, um, exercises based on think the places being dropped in rural areas, having to survive. Um, it's also quite near a couple of military bases. Brecon is home of a regiment there as well. Um, so as well as being a sort of a touristy um, nature reserve, it's also got that military side to it as well. Um, it's very popular with walkers and hikers, um, tourists coming in to see the various aspects of it. Horse riders and mountain bikers use the trails a lot. Um, there's some really excellent rock climbing surfaces. 
um, also some of the very high peaks are very good for hang gliders to come off, great thermals around there. Um, people come fishing in the lakes, um, people come camping, and there's also caving and cavers go into those. So there's lots of aspects of landscape that are used by a very broad range of people, but off, often for very sort of either nature or physical based activities. Um, there's a little bit less of the heritage that's explored there. And as a national park, it's governed by the Brecon Beacons National Park Authority. So it's sort of slightly outside of local council judgment, um, but instead it's used for uh, used by the National Park Authority as sort of a separate space. Their statement is that they are they serve to conservation and enhancement of the landscape and their promotion of its enjoyment of the public and in particular exercising planning functions across the designated area of the park. So that means they've got overall responsibility of making sure that conservation plans are in place, looking after the monuments that are in that area, and looking at things like planning for any development. Obviously, there's not going to be any housing developments anytime soon in the National Park, but they look at things like planning for infrastructure to do with the water and energy and electricity and that kind of thing, and also for application of places like heritage parks or any heritage features. Um, there is one part of sort of heritage landscape that is quite prominent, is the Brecon Mountain Railway, which is a narrow gauge steam railway. It's a really popular attraction, as most of the steam railways are. Um, but that sort of sits above and overrides the much wider industrial context of the landscape itself, the mining and quarrying and all the infrastructure around that tends to get lost in that conversation. The focus is purely on that steam railway. So what about the rest of that industrial past? Who wants to preserve that? Who wants to promote it? Well, there are some people out there. Um, and in particular, this project that I'm working on and several interest groups are looking at are the tram roads. Now, when I say tram roads to people in Brecon Beacons, they assume I mean the sort of the tram you see in the city centre, tram line for carrying people or for pleasure. But what this refers to in tram roads is actually industrial. So it's small, narrow gauge, usually horse-drawn wagon trams um, that were to bring um, coal, um, limestone and other materials from sites up in the hills down into the valleys and other industrialised areas of Wales. Um, and the two main ones that you will hear talk about are the Brecon Forest Tram Roads, which sort of it is, not all of it is within the Brecon Beacons National Park, but some of it is, and Brynor, which is um, an anglicisation of Brynoia, which is the Welsh word. Um, and rather than it being just one tram road, it's a huge interconnected network of lots of, sort of with bits that are unfinished or incomplete that were started and conceptualised but never done. Um, and there are a huge, vast sort of constellation of sites that connected these sort of like quarry sites and mines in the Brecon Beacons with canal networks and railways and other like offshore, um, like shipping out coal in South Wales and that South Wales industrial area. And it's not just the tram roads themselves, of course, there's every kind of associated site you would have with them. So the culverts that take the water away from the sites, um, lime kilns, um, the huts of guards are working on those tram lines, um, the quarries themselves, sidings for the carts, sawmills for the woods to build some of that infrastructure, housing for the horses and other animals that were in there, um, temporary workers accommodation for people building and then operating these sites so there's a massive impact on this landscape and it's not just this pure natural site that often you would associate with a national park it has a huge industrial heritage that's not really that sort of like communicated or really known about by most of the sort of everyday visiting public um, and this the main tram road project the brecon forest one was conceived by john christie who's a scottish born entrepreneur he had a fortune from indigo in india an indigo trade, um, and he was granted lands at the Great Forest of Brecon, also known as Forest Vaur, uh, and to exploit those lands and the, and the sort of like the raw materials in them, he conceptualised the Brecon Forest tram roads. Um, he did slightly overstretch because he built a vast, massive network and connected it um, down to South Wales into canals and roads that were was really like, beyond his capabilities. He actually went bankrupt in 1827, and it was taken on by his main creditor, who then connected it to Clearbath in the Upper Swansea Valley and connected it to the coal fields made it slightly more profitable. Um, but it was eventually superseded by rail and other like slightly larger infrastructure. And sort of like by the like, sort of latter end of the 19th century, they became, um, inc they became obsolete as monuments. So this project, the uh, Brecon Beacons Tram Roads project, um, it really seeks to sort of bring these sites to life a bit more, to make sure people are aware of them, to understand them, let's sure that they're not lost in the landscape. Often there's some very good preservation. They're in uplands that aren't very well trodden. They're not ploughed or farmed. Um, and they haven't been subject to a vast number of people going over them and sort of any vandalism or damage. But they will still be lost. Um, and the memory of them will be lost if this projects are not like this one and not brought forward to try and preserve them. Um, so there's main actors in this survey. We've got the Brecon Beacons Park Society, uh, which is a sort of a volunteer and community-led society, very interested in the park itself and everything that it contains, natural heritage, industrial, everything. 
um, along with ourselves, both Power Psychological Trust, the Brecon the Beacons National Park Authority um, and CADU are helping to provide some of the funding to make this project happen and hopefully we'll providing the scheduling for some of the monuments that we're working on. So the broad aim of this project is to safeguard the tram roads for the future. We don't want them to be forgotten. We don't want them to be an ignored part of the past of the Brecon Beacons National Park. Um, and to achieve this aim, we're gonna, it's going to be necessary to identify all surviving tram roads and survey their condition. So as you can appreciate from that list of um, associated sites with these tram roads, that is a massive task, a huge task for one organisation alone to do. Um, and that is why we're working in partnership, partnership is really key to this project, and training volunteers to make sure that as many people as possible can get on the ground to do this surveying, to look at the survival condition, to look at what, what remedial work needs to be done to protect them, and how we can work with other organisations like CADU to schedule and preserve them for future times. Um, from the beginning, beginning, it's all been about that partnership, and it's not an uneven partnership. So we all sit around a table, we all our ideas are listened to, each organisation um, contributes to the management, to the project planning, the project management, uh, and to the outputs and outcomes of the project. And that's what's really key for this project's success, is that one partner doesn't take over and run things their way. It's uh, a mutual process, a coming together of different ideas and strategies. So what it started out with was data and desk-based research. Now, Zoe Arthurs of this committee uh, will take a massive part in this because there was a huge amount of existing data that existed in places like archives. The uh, Brecon Beacons Park Society themselves had some data already that they gathered. And then in Archwilio, which is the, um, the Welsh portal for the historic environment record in Wales, um, contains a vast amount of information uh, that's not necessarily all been categorised or catalogued correctly over the years. Things could be missing. Uh, things could have been like incorrectly written in there. So the first stage of this project was to really get into that data and find out how much exists out there about these tram roads, how much is accessible, but also what's missing. What data could these volunteers be very usefully gathering that we can add to our existing data? And from that, which of these sites should we prioritise our attention on? As you can appreciate, there's hundreds and hundreds of sites out there that we could be looking at restoring, um, looking for scheduling, looking for funding to work on. So you would definitely need to prioritise to make sure that something happens rather than just overwhelmed by too much work to do. So this data gathering really helps us to boil down well, which sites should we make the priority of this research. And we can also pick through that data and look at, well, is there anything duplicated here? Is anything accidentally been logged in the wrong place twice? Is anything inaccurate? Does something need a bit more? the better photographs does it need a better recording better measurements so this research stage was really vital and to making sure that we narrowed down the project and get it really focused um, and from that uh, we look at uh, something open source very early on in the project we can start building the public to access is the mapping um, now these maps are researched and plotted by the brecon beacons park society members CPAT staff will host these on our website, but we're not creating these. This is all about collaborative data gathering. It's about working together to pick out that data and make it something shareable and open source. So they're using QGIS, which if you're not aware, it's um, a mapping and data modeling uh, program um, that takes sort of a data, mapping data, LIDAR data, um, any kind of um, open source uh, digital mapping systems like that, digital information systems, and it makes it so that anyone can access it and make um, models out of it, make mapping, um, and it's open source, so it's free to access, and there's lots of online manuals and support forums. That means that volunteers, uh, with a bit of encouragement, a bit of help, can all be trained to work collaboratively on this map together. And the training of those volunteers is a vital part of this project. It's not designed just to give one archaeologist a job for a year or two years. It's really about enriching an entire community, and that community can mean people in the local area or sort of a wider community of heritage enthusiasts. It's about upskilling everyone involved to make sure that people can know how to record a site in the field. They can know how to take photography. They know how to use digital scales so they're taking the right kind of measurements. They know how to use the historic environment record. They know what kind of data is needed in what format to make sure that it's uploaded for everyone to be able to access. Um, so this training is a huge part of the project. Now, this year is just a pilot phase. So all I've done is write a little manual about how volunteers can be trained and the key things they need to focus on. But going forward, we're hoping this will be sort of a two or three year project where the volunteers will have a programme of training in place sort of digitally or in person so that they can become sort of like their own little expertise in different aspects of the project. Without them, sort of a citizen science data gathering, a project of this size couldn't happen because we could never afford to bring in the amount of people we'd need to pay to get that kind of data gathering, that huge big data that we need to make this project happen. 
And again, as part of a pilot study, what we're going to do for this one, uh, this is going to happen hopefully between now and April next year, we're going to use one particular tram road, one particular collection of sites as a bit of a test case. So we're going to improve the records that already exist, look at the data that's on there and hopefully make a case to Candy that it should be scheduled because unbelievably, it's not already a scheduled monument. So this is Brinor that I mentioned earlier, which is the anglicization of Brinoria. Um, it's the most, basically the most complete survival within the national park itself of the tramways. Um, it runs from Taliban to Unusk, down to Limestone, Limestone Quarries and Dufferin Coronon. And it was constructed in 1814 and opened in 1815. Um, and it acted as sort of a feeder railway into Brecknock and Abergavenny Canal. Um, and as with many tramways in this region, it's primarily horse-drawn narrow gauge, um, carrying limestone and coal down the valley. Um, so yeah, it commenced in 1814, completed in 1815. Uh, built by Messrs. Dixon Overton for the Brinard Tramroad Company, and that was thanks to a clause uh, of the Brecon and Abergavenny Canal Act that permitted feeder lines um, up to eight miles in length to connect to the canal. So the Brinard Tramway is exactly eight miles in length. Um, the canal opened in 1799, so it really needed these feeder lines to bring in materials to it to make the canal line itself a success. It was designed to be nine feet in width with a surface of six inch uh, broken stone and then plate rails, each three feet, 11 inches in length, were held in place by cast iron sleepers, um, which, which were dovetailed end to end and rested on stone blocks. So all of that material itself, before we've even begun to quarry and use materials, leaves an impact on the landscape. That very act of, of constructing this tramway, the stone blocks where they were hewn from, the iron, the trackways where wagons are brought up to build the tramway itself, that's all impacted on the landscape. Um, so we had a tramroad office as well, that's located in Talibont on Usk, and two toll houses were believed to have been built. Only one survives at Talibont, the other one's not evident, so we think it might have been near the end at the eight mile post near Treville, but there's nothing left in the record to suggest where that might be. Um, and there's 13 passing bays or tumouts um, that were recorded in 1820, and not all of those still survive, but some of them still do. Um, the last known meeting of the Brunel Tramroad Company was 1890, um, but it seems to have faded away sort of a long time before then. It wasn't really a going concern anymore. There was a lack of funding, um, but it wasn't actually properly ever closed because you had to raise funds for the act of abandonment to require a train line like this, and they never raised those funds. So technically, it's only faded away, never actually. Um, so CPAT conducted a condition survey of the Brunel Tram Road in 2004. There was uh, a, an interest group called the Bernard Tram Road Conservation Forum, who are still active and we're hoping will be project partners with us on this. Um, and this survey produced a GIS data set and a fantastic photographic record of the condition of the tram road and those associated sites with it. And it was found to be in very good condition. Lots of features survive very well and could survive uh, go in perpetuity if it's probably maintained and scheduled and looked at. But at the moment, it does remain unlisted. So we've chosen this as a really key priority for the project because there's some fantastic um, elements to this site, like these wonderful lime kilns here you see in this picture. The trackway survives in very excellent condition in lots of places. Um, and it'd be a really great um, boost for the project beginning to get this as our test case listed and show the volunteers what they can achieve through this working collaboratively and then get the rest of the site scheduled after this. So our key things it wants to do at the moment, update that condition survey that CPAC did in 2004. Get back out there in the field, photograph it, measure it, do some aerial photographs and some drone work to see what it looks like from above the ground. What's the difference between now and 2004? Can we demonstrate that it's been damaged, that things have been lost? Can we make sure that going forward it's preserved and that CADU can have a strong case that scheduling would enact that preservation? Um, so we want to draft a scheduling application to CADU with all that new information, data and photographs that we gather. And then going forward, work with local, regional and national groups to do some public outreach, make some new walking trails, make new um, interpretation panels. This is one that exists on site already, which is quite functional, but it's quite difficult to read. It needs to be much bigger, have more diagrams and mapping, I think, to show the true extent of this magnificent tram route. So that's where we're at the project at the moment. We started gathering our data. We started um, looking at how we can train volunteers to do that huge big data gathering. We started to get some project partners in place and get people engaged just how important this project can be. Uh, we've been really pleasantly surprised if how many people are engaged with this industrial yeah. past that we thought it'd be a bit of a hard sell. But it still left us with some tricky questions. I've picked out three of my trickiest questions that I'm left with um, to put to you guys. And please feel free to contact me if you've got any thoughts on these. And the first of those is, how do we sell industrial heritage to visitors who are here to see and experience natural beauty? There's sort of a disconnect there between I'm here to experience the wild, to breathe the lungs of fresh air, 
How do we explain to them this used to be an industrial landscape? How do we make them sympathetic to wanting to restore and preserve that when that can be at odds with sometimes the way they want to interact with the landscape? And then following on from that, secondly, can the National Park Authority, who are based in Wales, who have a very strong emphasis on sustainability, on green development, on green projects. We have the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act as part of our sort of main swathe of legislation, which really is focused on um, rebuilding, building green, looking to a future, looking to a, um, a renewable future. How does that match then with promoting an industrial past? How can an authority based on these principles um, realistically also talk with pride and with um, interest in an industrial past. I believe it can happen, but it can sometimes take a little bit of organisational change, which can be quite scary. It can sometimes take a, quite a lot of like, training and really good communication, um, but it can be done, I think. But then thirdly, how can we guarantee that this scheduled status, if we achieve it for these sites, is a long-term protection? Just this week, we've seen the Dorman Long Tower have its listing stripped and it's to be demolished. So how can we work to make sure that passion and understanding and joy of these industrial sites is embedded in the community locally and nationally in Wales and beyond to make sure that this listing status is a permanent or at least very long term protection for these sites. I want to make sure these tram roads are sort of seen and appreciated and loved going forward and so how do we make sure that's going to happen? If you've got any thoughts on any of those questions or indeed any part of this project at all, um, if you want to talk to me about how to get partnership working off the ground how you want if you want to talk to me about how to work with communities rather than design a project and bring them in later how what the great value is of working in partnership and working to upskill volunteers please do contact me this is our twitter account at cpt archaeology you feel free to email me and check out the brecon beacons park society they do some fantastic work promoting all of the heritage of the past for their society they're a really engaged sort of like really active group and i think that we should definitely be encouraging these kind of groups in particular um, to work on their heritage and to make sure that we keep working with them and value their contribution. Thank you very much. I hope um, everybody was able to hear that in the end. Um, we're all learning all the time. <laughs> uh, that, that was fine, Bill. As you say, we are all learning. Uh, all the time um, and that's that's one of the benefits of having a group of people as we have today who who might have skills who can be called upon immediately to help so so that that, that was most fortuitous the final um speaker for this afternoon before we go into the round table with the young members board is emma lockwood and i know emma is here in person so uh Emma, I'm going to hand over to you to talk a bit uh, about uh, publication. Thank you, Emma. Yes, yeah, sure. I had to unmute myself. Right? Hopefully, you can see the slides. Um, just bear with me one second. I just, oh, guys, yeah, so I can see my notes as well. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, um, everyone. And thank you um, for inviting me and Zoe as well to speak today. So, um, for those who don't know me, I'm Emma and I'm the portfolio manager at Routledge which is the humanities and social science imprint of Taylor and Francis. And I see a list, oversee a list of archaeology and anthropology journals, including the AIA's Industrial Archaeology Review. Um, we've also got um, Liz Cahoon on the phone as well, who, who might be helping me with the chat a bit later. She's the um, global head of the Heritage and Library Information Science Portfolio. Um, so today's seminar will be, we've sort of called it a seminar because it's a bit different actually I think from the other presenters, so I'll begin by talking about the challenges that we faced um, as a publisher during the pandemic and some of the common publishing trends that we've noticed. Um, the second half of the session will be more of an open discussion on how we can improve um, inclusivity and equity within academic journals, so that's where I'd really love to hear from, from all of you and hear about your experiences and recommendations. Um, so yeah, before I get started, I just wanted to cover some ground rules. Um, yeah, all, all feedback, questions, um, comments are welcome. Um, I think you've probably heard this earlier, but yes, please do raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted during the presentation section, which will be marked in blue in the slides. Um, alternatively, you're welcome to add your comments and questions to the, to the chat throughout the, the session. Um, I've asked for the participation session not to be recorded, um, just so everyone can sort of speak freely. Um, and the results from the quick fire survey that's included in the presentation um, will only be used to aid discussion of this event, but will be shared with the young members board. 
Um, please also yeah, do remember to treat others' opinions and comments with respect and be mindful of how your comments might affect others. Um, so uh, just as a quick overview of um, this session. So I'll speak for around 10 minutes um, on the impact the pandemic has had on scholarly publishing and the potential repercussions it's had on diversity and inclusion. So that then should hopefully lead into the next part where we can have that group discussion on what barriers you might have encountered to getting your research published, whether during the pandemic or otherwise. Um, and then from there, we can talk about ways we can remove some of those barriers and improve diversity, equity and inclusion in journals publishing. Um, so yeah, publishing during the pandemic. <laughs> Um, so early in 2020, our Taylor and Francis offices were closed in accordance with the lockdown restrictions in the countries we operate, including our head office in the UK. Um, so we faced many of the same challenges as other organisations, including staff's inability to work due to sickness, self-isolation, caregiving responsibilities and a lack of um, access to resources and equipment. Um, it's fair to say that our manufacturing and production colleagues were particularly affected. Uh, for example, uh, many of our colleagues work on typesetting and copy, copy editing are based in India, um, a country that has been and is still is severely affected by the pandemic. So as well as facing the health crisis, um, these colleagues were forced to work from home with, without the access to the resources and equipment they needed to do that job. Um, also, like many others, we've seen that huge increase in online meetings, both internally with colleagues and externally with our partners, including academic societies and journal editors. Um, in many ways, this has allowed for broader engagement. Um, I think as an example, we had an industrial archaeology um, editorial board meeting earlier this year, which allowed lots of well, all the members mostly, I think we had attend and, and based from many countries over the world. Um, however, on the opposite side of this, there's not been that opportunity to have those ad hoc conversations and personal interactions you might get in the office space or a face to face meeting. Um, just oh. To see if there's someone in the chat. Oh, no, sorry. Okay, I wondered if it was a comment about someone not being able to hear me, but we're okay. <laughs> um, also, the point about the um, the online meetings. Um, there's this question of whether, I guess, online meetings uh, is creating this tech technology divide. Um, not everyone is comfortable with using online technologies or has sort of access or good quality Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, We've also seen, um, like it's been discussed, an increase in online conferences, um, which means for us that we've not had a physical presence or publication stand at a conference for archaeology or heritage since before the coronavirus outbreak. Um, this has limited our opportunities to network, um, meet new people, and also have that physical we have publication stand where often we have those ad hoc conversations of delegates um, speaking to students about our research and suggesting journals and things like that. Um, so in terms of our journals, we've seen an increase in online article submissions with anecdotal feedback that more research is being submitted by men than women. Um, we've also seen an increase in online readership with a wider, more geographical, um, graphically diverse readership. And um, lastly, in some areas, we've had um, challenges and our editors had challenges finding peer reviews at the time needed to commit to doing a peer review. Um, so this is just a very quick overview of some of the main challenges and trends that we've noticed. Um, I do have some data to support um, some of these points, whilst others are more anecdotal, resulting from feedback from editors, um, colleagues and other publishing partners. Um, so to take you through some data that I do have, on this slide you'll see a graph showing the spike in submissions we saw to all our journals from March 2020 when several countries went into lockdown. Um, it is worth noting um, that pre-pandemic, we were seeing that steady increase in submissions. However, there is that, that big jump up after, after this line here in April 2020. Um, to break this down further, in the next uh, couple of slides, I've, I've shown the submission trends for four key countries. Um, so if we look here at the UK and US, you can see there was an uplift in submissions soon after the two countries went into lockdown in spring 2020. Submissions then seem to sort of settle back down later in the year to the 2019 average line, which is depicted here in grey. Um, however, if we look at China and India, we see uh, two very different pictures. Um, the pandemic appears to have had little or no impact on submissions we've received from China. 
The growth in submissions is in keeping with the growth we've seen prior to the outbreak. And the dips that you can see on this graph are caused by um, national holidays around Chinese New Year. Um, in contrast to this, submissions from India have grown dramatically throughout the pandemic and are yet to drop back down to that average number we saw pre-outbreak. Um, and now to move on and quickly look at gender. Um, so Routledge and Turner and Francis do not collect data on our, on our author's gender for various reasons. So I'm able to report on the differences that we've seen um, other than the sort of antidote, antidotal feedback um, from submissions between men and women during the pandemic. De Groyters, um, the publisher, have uh, conducted some research into this. And on this slide, you'll see some extracts from their analysis of two surveys they conducted in 2020. So just over 3,000 of that author's um, of books and journal articles completed the survey with both um, uh, STEM and HSS, coming from both STEM and HSS disciplines. Um, so uh, over half the authors who responded to the survey said that they are busier now than before the coronavirus outbreak um, and also the subsequent closure of the universities with women being more likely to be busier than men. Some of the reasons given for this in, in the survey responses were the lack of resources. This was particularly felt for humanities researchers, which I think um, Zoe touched on earlier and the lack, access, lack of access to things like archives, um, libraries and mm. physical sites. Um, there was also the pressures of online teaching, uh, caregiving responsibilities, lack of home workspace and lack of in-person collaboration. Um, so some, some concluding remarks on the survey can be viewed on this slide. Uh, De Groyter recognised that there is a gender divide, with women bearing the brunt of more domestic duties during the pandemic, leaving them with less time to focus on their research and careers. They find that mid-career women are in particular affected. They are writing less, reading less, publishing less, and spending less time on data analysis, conference participation than their male colleagues. Um, so I've provided the links on this slide to the full report, which um, is well worth a read, and um, also a blog post, which has been authored by the um, two of the data analysts at De Groyter. Um, so, before I move on, um, I'd like to sort of pause here and see if anyone does have any sort of questions or, or comments on, on the trends that um, I've just discussed. Um, and I appreciate there is quite a lot hidden within that sort of quick review of the data, including sort of regional differences, difference between academic disciplines, which is quite difficult to unpick. So I, I'd really be interested to hear from you and hear from your thoughts and experiences. Um, we we'll also have time in the next section to talk about yeah, the barriers, like I said, to submitting research and delve deeper into those questions around inclusivity. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I'm happy not to chair the round table uh, because it's a young members board afternoon. So um, if, I, uh, if I stand back and let somebody else uh, chair the round table, what I would just say before we go into the round table is it is getting on for it's 17 minutes past four. Um, lots of people have been here since 10.30. That's not to foreshorten any discussion on the roundtable, but just to bear in mind that um, there is a certain amount of screen fatigue. So, uh, But I'm sure a lively discussion will put that to one side. So um, I'm happy to hand over to the Young Members Board, looking at uh, looking at Zoe over there, uh, potentially, and and Juan to, to perhaps lead any discussion. So... This is your opportunity from the floor to raise issues from the talks this afternoon. And indeed, if you've got a burning question from this morning, uh, but particularly the talks this afternoon, uh, and maybe some of our young members board might want to kick things off by uh, picking up on uh, a number of points. So over to you. Lovely. Hello, everybody. I think what I'll do is start with three questions that we've got outstanding in the chat um, and I'll welcome all YMB, especially our chair Vanessa, uh, to unmute, and uh, Emma, if you want to jump in as well, because that will be really helpful. For the first question uh, from Sue, um, who says, I, ca I can't help but say that is um, an academic research-based analytical journal inherently exclusive, not in a bad way, but for those who read for interest or fun, uh, such as volunteers, is it maybe too highbrow to be more inclusive 
does there need to be different levels to suit different levels or reasons for involvement with the sector um what do you think yeah i mean um it, we one of the misconceptions about publishing and journals is that you only have to be a sort of doctor and be at an institution to publish um you can publish at any level we we sort of welcome um submissions from practitioners um, and people like volunteers working in sectors. I mean, different journals will have um, their instructions for authors, which they'll set out as sort of article type. So for some people, um, perhaps a research article isn't, isn't the most appropriate. There is opinion pieces, as we said, or um, feedback from the field. If you did have something that you really wanted to say as a volunteer at Heritage Sector, I'd, um, and the instructions for authors didn't have the article type, I would recommend that you get in touch with the journal editor and suggest this as, as an article. Um, and see what they'd find. I mean, for groups like the AIA, if it's not suitable for the journal, it could also be suitable maybe for the newsletter um, or, or maybe a blog post or something like that. Um, so there's there's different routes that like you said to sort of um, to put your opinion out there. Um, and I think in some, it depends on the journal as well. We do publish some journals um, that are based on like community archaeology or public archaeology. So much more tailored to those practitioner voices. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say read read the journal's aims and scopes, instructions for authors. Um, I can see Ian's got something to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would just like to uh, sort of echo what Emma said there. Really, um, we we um, it's certainly as far as um, industrial archaeology review is concerned, we 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 don't we don't have a, a category for short notices so, or short shorter um, articles simply because we don't really receive them. But uh, you know, we we do we do sometimes. Uh, you know, we, we, if, if the opportunity arises, we encourage people to send us something which is less than a sort of 6,000 word um, research article, uh, if, if, uh, if, if that's appropriate. But uh, generally speaking, we don't get them. But, with, you know, if people are thinking along those lines, and I, know, I, I noticed a comment in chat, particularly earlier, about um, the difficulty of, um, uh, of, of commercially funded projects taking an article through to full uh, the full blown article and, and the sort of work in progress or some summary type thing uh, about field work would you know I think I think the scope there that we perhaps are not uh, not exploring at the moment. That's really exciting that's definitely something the YMB can bring up in future meetings uh, to see if we can't come up with some sort of press release to say that we would welcome um, mm. that sort of engagement and contribution and um, you know we can negotiate something that suits everybody because we do want to be inclusive um and we want to incorporate diversity in all of its senses and and uh yeah so that's a that's a good idea and it's going on the notepad um uh next question um let's have a look was about my presentation um people's research methods uh, have changed since lockdown and how is the use of physical archives changing and how can we improve that accessibility in future? Uh, what do people think about funding for digitization? Is that something people would support? Um, I'm putting this out to the floor, so please raise your hand or just unmute um, and let us know your opinion. I think practically digitalization is is vital to our industry. If we actually look at things like commercial archaeology, the funding does not allow for that much engagement with physical archives. If you can very easily and quickly access the information online, it's much more likely to be engaged with on a research basis. And it's also much easier for any member of the public to see. So if a member of the public suddenly decides they want to see the plans for the factory that you work with, for example, they can. Uh, and it, it will vastly increase the hits on your website. It will likely increase your visitor numbers because people get a lot more infused about these uh, sites. Yeah, I think it would be a really valuable resource um, to have a, a project dedicated to digitising archives. Uh, and I hope it's something, uh, as we try and build, build volunteer bases again, that we can look at and try and build some projects with archives. Um, Just going to chip in from the publisher's perspective, because obviously we have all our journal archives online. Um, and, you know, we sell the archives in different ways to 
institutions through our sales arrangements. But one of the great benefits of being members of organisations like the AIA and the, in the broader communities is that there is access to the full journal back archive. So, you know, you're able, you don't need to be at an institution to actually access the content. Um, I don't work in books, but speaking for our books colleagues, I know there is more of a push to get more books digitised as well. I mean, that, that became increasingly apparent through the pandemic that it, uh, you know, what a struggle it was for people to access um, books. So, you know, most books now are published as, as e-books. Um, so there is that electronic format there as well. So I think certainly from a publisher's perspective, um, journals, we are there, books, there is more of a shift in, in that direction as well. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move on to the next question, just because I am aware people have been here a long time, so I'm going to try and answer as many as I can, um, so we can wrap up by 4.30. Um, a really interesting question, um, how does everyone see the relationship between industrial archaeology and the history of technology? Uh, in my view, the history of technology is as important as other histories and should be a fundamental part of the school curriculum. This would be a great opportunity for industrial archaeology. What do members of uh, the Young Members Board think uh, oh. about that? This was from me, by the way, Colin Jenkins. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, because I am a, um, a volunteer at Kirkaldi's Testing Museum in London, which is a very specialised museum that very much overlaps with the history of technology and a technology that's continuous. So it's really about the continuity of the history of technology. Yeah, definitely. And, and I can see that our work sometimes um, does bleed out from the period known as the Industrial Revolution or uh, industrial archaeology. Um, as Juan discussed it, um, the, the theoretical side of things, and there is going to be that overlap. And it'd be interesting um, to see what you guys think um, about how we incorporate those two things. Definitely. And I think also, given that we're in such a digital era with mobile phones and everything kind of online, we, for young people to actually understand where that has come from I think, yes. and to kind of understand the analog technology as well to kind of get that background because like, I'm, I'm of the age where we had both growing up and I think that kind of adaptation between the different technologies is something that children today don't have because they've mm. they've grown up straight into mobile internet technology so I think that kind of understanding of the history and how it's developed would really engage them with industrial sites as well I think yes very I think, good point very good point I think Taylor and Francis I can't understand why you actually separated out the AIA IA review from the journal, the International Journal from the History of Technology. They're in two different sections of your catalogue. I think that's just um, that one section deals with history of science and that journal went to that group and the industrial archaeology stayed with the oh. archaeology group. So it's more a kind of um, internal um, division of how the journals are, are worked on, but that we certainly do engage with our colleagues working on the journal as well. I said it at the time though, but they don't appear on the same stands at conferences, etc. Oh, well, yeah, they should, should. And yet they are so closely yes, linked so that that's yeah. raised the question. Mm. Oh, yeah, the history of technology belongs closer together than it does to the history of science. Yeah. Mm. I think I included it in the um the slides but yeah it's always a bit of a um challenge for conferences because we've, we've been turning to sort of like having having less of a kind of um huge sort of stand at conferences prior to the pandemic for like environmental reasons um so having those sort of select journals but um but yeah we, we often listen to like editors as well and societies who's who are running the conferences and what they want to see but um so yeah i i, I, I will sort of look into that and and try and make sure that the two are kind of seen together at appropriate conferences but there's often this decision when we have these large conferences of what, what to send and to make sure that we've got a good overall representation of all of our all of our um, journals which are quite vast 
Okay. Um, so I, I, I oh, sorry, I, no, I just no, would like to, to say that uh, thinking about the series of uh, industrial archaeology workshops and also thinking about this discussion, uh, maybe we can have a fourth East West uh, online workshop on industrial archaeology on the topic of the archaeology of technology. Uh, that uh, I think it would be a, a way of including in the same discussions uh, the history of technology and the social aspects of uh, industrialization. Yes, that idea. Mm. It's the thing that's made the modern world comfortable and livable in. <laughs> that's the thing we need to surely applaud. Yes, certainly. And it does lead in to um, a comment from Vanessa about achieving inclusivity by combining online digital conferences with the in-person format um, and how we can yeah. improve, you know, how can we improve inclusivity? Um, because there, there does come additional uh, challenges and barriers to that format as well, such as time difference, as one's probably feeling right now, <laughs> um, is, you know, there is... Um, additional challenges, uh, things like um, access for, for sight impaired or hearing impaired uh, people and making sure that this technology continues to develop in order to um, enable engagement from a lot of different people. I wanted to kind of raise that question because I wanted to find out if people had, after Joe asked the questions, if anyone has had any ideas about how one can actually continue with the benefits of online meetings, but also meet in person, because inevitably putting a laptop down for a couple of people to attend while the other people do a live event, it's just not fair on some people. So has anyone had any thoughts about how you can continue that combined engagement? The, uh, I was just going to say that um, uh, more than one society that I'm involved with, including the AIA, is certainly looking very seriously and trying to plan how to do hybrid conf conferences uh, in the near future. Um, the One of the positives of COVID is that those societies I'm involved with have had hugely increased numbers attending their meetings um, from other parts of the UK and all over the world who just weren't able to come to those presentations or events before. Um, and I know they very much want to continue to do that. So it's got to be something that's uppermost in our minds, how we plan to do that. Ian? Yeah, I, I, I think we're finding more and more venues are, are equipping themselves for, for, for genuine um, hybrid blended meetings. Um, with 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 proper projection facilities and 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 cameras and uh, microphones and so on, so that so that the people who are watching remotely are getting something close to the experience of the people in the hall. So it, you know, the, to, I think the technology has, has, has played quite a, quite a quite a change in the part in the past year. So um, I'm you know I think that's something we will be looking for. For example, uh, if if AIA has a proper physical conference. Um, in future, we, you know, one, one, of the, one of the parameters we will be looking for is that is facilities that uh, you know facilitate genuine particip remote participation. That's great. Um, Otis, did you have your mic off for a moment? Did you have anything to add? Uh, well, I've, I think Vanessa's already put it in the chat, but a, a really key thing with more online meetings than online conferences is giving us a large screen. The, the people attending online, because um, for, for example, uh, CIFA meeting for the Chartered Institute for Archaeology, if we have a hybrid meeting, we tend to meet in a room with a big screen on a wall so that you can actually still see all the participants. It's not just a laptop sat on somebody's desk. And it really, it really does help. And also uh, knowing how to use uh, systems like uh, the the surround sound audio speaker microphone things that you you regularly find on a meeting room table but aren't usually plugged into uh, the 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 conferencing computer which doesn't help um, it's 
it, it is important that whoever's organising the technical side of things has seen the room and knows how everything works uh, long before the meeting. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great idea and it's um, something that a lot of venues and places will need to direct a, a bit of money to in the, the next year or two to to become more desirable for people like us who are looking for hybrid conferences and it's you know it's going to be something that everybody's looking for. Emma? I was uh, sort of partly um, onto that and to your presentation Zach, but I was wondering did you have any experience maybe with um, heritage institutions and that kind of public engagement that could help with um, or online public engagement that could help with, with this or what we could learn from um, thinking of academic conferences or if they have similar same problems? <laughs> um, I think it took everybody by surprise and I think nobody was really prepared at the point in time where I was undertaking my research. Um, I was within my first few weeks of placement when the lockdown was announced and so now nearly sort of two years on and, and submission complete it would be I think a, a different story still challenging um, but most of my engagement was done through uh, individual one-to-one -one contacts and uh, email and Zoom was, you know, but a twinkle in people's eye at that point. <laughs> um, we're all, uh, you know, more well-versed in it now. But yeah. I do think engagement would be more achievable now, especially when you look at projects like the Flex Mill Maltings. Uh, Historic England have done some great online workshops um, to get the community involved. Um, mm. And the Friends of the Flex Mill have been really good at um, promoting large sessions within communities to try and, you know, gauge people's thoughts um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Also so, social media and I think the stuff mm. you've been doing, yeah, um, sort of complements conferences and those kind of events as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, given the time, sorry we've run five minutes over, I'm going to let everybody go, but thank you so much for coming along and please follow us um, on our social media and get in touch. Our email address is available via the uh, AIA website. Um, and it's been great and really insightful as well. And we've got some ideas to take away. Um, I'll hand over to Bill to say goodbye to everybody and sign us out. But thank you from the YMB. Um, I don't know whether, no, Mike's not coming back in. Uh, yes, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I, I can come back in if you want, Bill, but. <laughs> <laughs> you could round it up. Okay, oh, just very, very briefly, because I know we are starting to lose. Uh, people. Thank you very much to all our speakers today uh, for uh, making the time, both this morning and especially this afternoon. Uh, the AIA is very proud of its young members board. You are very much the next generation of the discipline, although sometimes you do make me feel quite old, but that's that's just me personally. Uh, but it's 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 great to see the dynamism, dynamism and interest that we've uh, that the young members board is generating. There's some very serious questions that you are uh, that you're uh, looking at, um, and that's been showcased this afternoon. It's also great to see so many people uh, at the research seminars. They, 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 they can be seen for the AIA as being slightly drier than the rest of our normal conference. But actually, in many ways, this is the powerhouse of the next generation of thought about the importance of industrial archaeology and heritage. And finally, I, I'd just like to thank uh, our webmaster, Bill, who's had to put up with the online conference for three three sessions now three weekends and there's one one more to go um thank you bill uh, we couldn't have done without you aia has adapted continues to adapt and uh the next online session will of course include our rolt memorial lecture and the agm and that again that will all be online and our rolt memorial lecture this year is dr cassie newland who uh, many of you will know from her work in telecommunications, archaeology thereof. So, so please do join us for that um, that session, which is uh, at the end of well, um, uh, coming up in the next few weeks' time. Um, 
One week's time from this afternoon. One week's time. One week's time from this afternoon. Thank you, Bill. I was struggling there to to to, to realise what, what date it is, what what year uh, what year it is. Frankly, thanks to lockdown. Um, so <laughs> it's it's been that kind of eighteen months. So look, thank you very much, everybody. It's great to have an international audience. It's great to have an audience of professionals and 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 so many volunteers and so many museum people as well, uh, demonstrating that that. When it comes to industrial archaeology and heritage research, we are um, we're a broad spectrum, and um, but we need to get broader uh, as well. So, but thank you very much, everybody. It, it's time to go off and find a darkened room to lie down in, or or a biscuit and a cup of tea. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>